the talk of Alexander. So, you have the floor. Um, thank you, the organizers, for your time here. Always a pleasure. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a compilation of our two ACML papers on compression with shallow auto encoders. This was joint effort with another PhD student, Kevin. He's there, uh, Hamid, and Marco. So let me start with the usual blah, blah motivation. At this point, it's to no surprise that autoencoding architectures of some sorts are very prominent cornerstone in many applications of machine learning, such as generative modeling, representation learning. They're also used widely in inverse problems and uh, in data compression, sometimes even out of outperforming classical algorithms such as JPEG. However, even in the shallow case, uh, the theoretical understanding of such models is quite limited. So in linear case, uh, when your encoding is linear and decoding is linear, uh, pretty much everything is known, and I can summarize all these results along the lines of PCA behavior. However, once you introduce a nonlinear model, either in encoding and, or decoding, then the results are not quite yet there, especially for deep models. What is known is that if you consider a shallow autoencoders, meaning that so your encoding will be just a linear transform and nonlinearity, and your decoding will be just linear transform back to the initial space, then if the model is severely underparameterized, there are some results which show that uh, dynamics converge to a certain solution and uh, provide this description. Or if the, in some specific training regime, such as mean field regime, uh, the model is highly overparameterized, which means that the compressed representation here grows polynomially of degree at least two in input dimension, which results somewhat in divergent compression rate. Okay, to be more precise mathematically, we look at the uh, two a prototypical two-layer model, so we take our input signal x, we project it, well, depending on dimension, we uh, transform it even at a higher space, then we apply nonlinearity, and then we uh, linearly transform back. Uh, what is important here is that we will look at the case when the input data is Gaussian, uh, with mean zero and some covariant sigma, and we will uh, fix the activation to be a sign activation, which corresponds to uh, one bit compression of signal X. Okay, let me give a few remarks why sign is uh, somewhat an important model to consider. Uh, first of all, it has a quite nice connection to a classical coding theory. You can think of it as compressing sequence X of length D uh, to N bits, uh, which is a well studied thing in the coding theory and information theory. In another important remark is that sign is scale invariant. So in particular, if you scale the rows of B by some constant, uh, nothing really changes. So in particular, this property prevents the model entering in so-called linear regime. Okay, how can you enter the linear regime? Uh, say that your sigma has a well-defined derivative at zero. So then you can just expand around zero and get model which basically behaves something like this. Well, this will be a linear model and there is an intuition that pretty much all the results from the previous linear case should apply, namely the PCA-like behavior. So the sign won't allow you to do that. You won't be able to linearize. Now, uh, with respect to the objective, uh, of, with respect to which we seek optimal parameters A and B, uh, we look at the population risk so there will be no remarks about generalization error for such model because we directly look at the population risk. And it's very important that we look at the fixed compression rate. Uh, compression rate means that you look at the dimension of your hidden representation and uh, divided by the dimension of the input, and this ratio is fixed. Although we allow for n and d to grow large. So to, to give a bit of embedding with respect to the previous works, the work by Rifinetti and Gold and Cui and Folks was looking at a rate which is going to zero, so it's severely somewhat underparameterized. And uh, the work by Nguyen and Folks was looking at the rate which is diverging. 
Uh, let me also remark that the models considered in this work are very different. Uh, because, say, Kui was looking at the, not autoencoding, but denoising, which is a different problem. And uh, I guess the closest one with respect to the setup uh, is this work, which relies on mean field analysis and has a diversion rate. So here it's very important that we have a proportional regime. Um, okay, so let me go somewhat with the results. So first of all, since uh, we will look uh, as a first example into isotropic Gaussian case, in this case, since we have a Gaussian signal, we can do Hermit expansion and uh, arrive to a nice enough equivalent formulation of the population risk. Uh, you can notice here that the rows of B are fixed to norm one because sine is uh, homogeneous and we really don't care about the norms of the, of the individual rows of B. What is important here is that, well, this looks like a linear algebra problem now, which is quite nice. Unfortunately, F here is applied element-wise and not in the usual spectral sense. Uh, the important part about function F is that it's odd function, and we will rely very heavily on this property for our analysis. Okay, all in all, we are able to get this bound for the population risk. Uh, it, I, I will have slide with its visualization, so no need to try doing it uh, in your head. Uh, what is important here is that the, for, for the rates which are smaller or equal to one, this bound is tight, and we can actually co <clears throat> characterize all the minimizers of this objective. For rate higher than one, uh, it's asymptotically tight, meaning that we can provide a sequence of, uh, of a certain candidates, which in high dimensional limit will uh, achieve this lower bound. So basically, for the rate small or equal to one, the minimizers will be uh, weight tied rotationally invariant matrices, which means that uh, A will be transpose of B up to some scaling, and B can be any orthogonal matrix or a, a row subsampled matrix. Now, for the rate higher than one, a somewhat similar design will uh, achieve the lower bound. So basically, it will be rotationally invariant with a particular spectrum. Now, let me go into the uh, nice visualizations. So what you can see on the right is uh, evaluation of the lower bound and the certain optimization algorithms. Uh, so let me go quickly through it. So PRM will correspond to basically taking this trace objective, which is equivalent of the population risk, and just doing a gradient descent-like algorithm on B and A. SGD corresponds to just taking autoencoder, uh, feeding its samples from the Gaussian, uh, and learning the ways of the autoencoder. What is important to note is that uh, since we have sine, we cannot really differentiate through it to get the backprop. So what we will do is that on forward, we will use sine, and on backward, we will use so-called straight-through estimator, where we basically substitute sine as if there was a hyperbolic tangent with a fixed temperature. And we train model like that. Uh, vector AMP is uh, uh, a conjecture to be optimal algorithm under a rotational invariant design, uh, which means that if you fix matrix B to be right rotationally invariant and select optimal spectrum, which was computed in this paper, although for expected expectation propagation algorithm, but it's closely connected to WAMP. So if you use uh, an optimal design from there, we expect that it's, it will be optimal for WAMP. And the uh, rate distortion here, it indicates basically the best you can do asymptotically. Uh, so basically nothing can beat this. Uh, as we can see that uh, one, uh, as we can see that lower bound uh, basically saturates uh, this vector AMP algorithm, which is conjectured to be optimal for the rate which is smaller or equal to one. So in this case, it's a bit surprising uh, because it means that two-layer autoencoding model is optimal given the rotational invariant design. What happens with WAMP in this case is basically converges in one step. And it kind of mimics the architecture of the autoencoding. Now, we can still see that we are quite far away from the rate distortion function, which is an orange. And uh, frankly speaking, in order to alleviate that, you might consider not a shallow encoding, but something much more powerful. Uh, but probably like error correcting codes, but it's quite, uh, 
ambiguous how to map them in any uh, NN based architecture. Uh, that's it, yeah. So, let me give some evidence that the results are not entirely bogus. Uh, so we will look at the natural data basically on MNIST data and CIFAR data. Here we will force uh, the isotropic covariance by just whitening the data. So we will take the data, compute the empirical uh, covariance matrix, and then multiply each sample by the inverse square root of it. As you can see, that the, the Gaussian predictions work quite well on the Gaussian data in almost all the cases. Uh, the discrepancies are there because the data is natural, but we are very close. Uh, now, I think I will go uh, through the proof because it's quite a nice idea once you know you watch what you're looking for, and it's basically a linear algebra. Uh, so the idea is the following. This trace objective had uh, a function f, which was dependent on BB transpose. Uh, now, the idea is that we will look at each power separately. So we look at expansion of f and look at the correct amount of the second trace and to try to minimize all these objectives separately. Now, the idea here is that, well, PP transpose is a PSD matrix with unit diagonal. And we can basically relax the objective by saying that, well, it's some PSD matrix Q now, because we can always rewrite this trace as, as this trace of the product. And we get uh, BB transpose to some power here. And uh, in particular, it's important that <clears throat> we can do this type of SVD uh, for which uh, diagonal will be unit. This will be important because we will basically plug an identity here, identity somewhere here, and then we will rearrange terms. So <laughs> let's just do that. Uh, redefining a few quantities, we can arrive at objective which basically looks like this. Now, this is, this is quite suspiciously looking like a square of something. So basically the idea now is to complete the square and get the lower bound. Um, a few important remarks, so uh, this is rate small or equal to one. Uh, and uh, for this case, we can prove uniqueness by just somewhat intersecting the minimizers for individual objectives. And using one linear algebra result on top. Now, for the case of rate higher than one, uh, the matrix BB transpose is no longer full rank. So somewhat the estimate for rate smaller than one will no longer work, and we need to use something a bit tighter. Luckily for us, there was this uh, paper uh, which provided a very nice low rank bound on the Hadamard product of PSD matrices. It's written here. So now basically the idea is that all the terms in the Taylor expansion of F, which have power uh, three or higher, they kind of behave like identity, so we can assume that they are full rank and treat them basically as they were treated previously for rate uh, smaller or equal to one case. Now, the term which is linear, well, for this we will use uh, this bound from Kare and others. And, okay, how you do that, you basically uh, decouple your first linear term from the rest, and you have this uh, t t trace here from the objective. So now, now what we will do, you will trade off with some correct weight this trace into both of these terms. And this is quadratic and BA, so you can minimize it right away. And for the terms here in this sum, you will, we will basically use optimistic estimate for rate small or equal to one because we will just pretend that BB transpose is of full rank. Which is kind of true in high dimensional limit when you when you use a matrix concentration for rotation and invariant design. So yeah, that's the idea. Any questions so far? Either everything is okay or, everything, or nothing is okay. <laughs> okay, let me move on. Uh, uh, so this was a lower bound. Uh, we kind of quantified it minimizers, but now the question is that is if we train this model with something gradient based, can we actually saturate the lower bound and find the corresponding minimizers? So I will present all the results for eight smaller or equal to one, because for eight higher than one, we don't have a rigorous result. We have a conjecture that it works kind of the same way, although it will require a bit of a tighter analysis because now we have a somewhat degenerate spectrum. 
but I will mention it nonetheless. So uh, first thing we look at is weight tight gradient flow. What is motivation for that? Well, our minimizers are weight tight. So let's just weight tie weights right away and look at the corresponding gradient flow in the encoding weights B. Well, now then the objective will look like this. It's just rewriting, nothing fancy happened. And then we will basically compute the gradient with respect to each of the rows of B and we will project it on the sphere. All right, and uh, this scaling beta since optimization objective is convex on it, we will just at each time step pick optimal. Now we can obtain that, uh, well, BB transpose will indeed converge to something, uh, uh, some rotation, and uh, this convergence can be made quantitative. Uh, so the idea of the proof is essentially to look at the correct quantity. Uh, basically, we will control the time derivative of the log determinant of BB transpose via some nice enough function phi, uh, which depends on time t. Uh, and then, basically, what you can say is that if you look at the stationary points of the gradient flow, the only high rank stationary point there is, is a rotation. And since, since log that is non-decreasing, you will never collapse to a uh, degenerate subspace, so you will converge to only one available full rank fixed point. And uh, the quantitative resultant convergence can be obtained by basically integrating uh, uh, th this uh, equation in, in, in T and using two estimates with respect to how far away you are from the uh, uh, rotation with respect to BB transpose. And basically, if you're far enough, it will take you a const at most constant time to converge to nice enough region at which your conversion speed will be linear in the required precision. All right, now, weight tying is somewhat a bit of a cheating because we know that at the optimization uh, objective optima, the weights are weight tight. Now let's look at something which is more fair, I guess. Since the objective is convex in A, uh, we, we can always uh, compute the optimal with fixed B. And then we will just do a steps in our B, uh, encoding weights, given the optimal decoding weights A. So it can be formalized like this. This is just pseudo inverse. And then we compute the gradient of our loss. We make a step and then we project on the sphere. So you can think of it somewhat as a gradient descent co coordinate wise. So we make a step on B we make an optimal step on A, and then we alternate them. Now what we can show is that uh, for A it's strictly smaller than one, so one is not included because we don't wanna deal with uh, elements of spectra which are approaching zero very close. Uh, and if you fix a learning rate we to be uh, on order of one over square root D and initialize our weights as in practice by uh, a Gaussian and then normalizing them because we're on the sphere, then we get this nice uh, convergence result. And what is important here is that it holds for sufficiently large D. So we are not taking the limits of D to infinity at any point. And uh, the constants here depend only on rate and the uh, coefficients of function f in Taylor expansion. Well, now let me give you a brief idea how the proof works. So, since uh, any rotation should work in the minimizer, uh, it's quite natural to think that, well, maybe the rotation in the beginning is already good enough, and the only thing we are doing is minimizing, this, uh, optimizing the spectra. So basically, at each iteration, we can decompose our BB transpose as uh, rotation times the spectrum and rotation transpose, and this rotation is the same one as at initialization, so for B, equal to uh, at time step zero. And then we carefully subtract this error term xt at each iteration. What is nice here is that this spectrum update is exact and we can get the exponential c convergence to the desired spectrum of the rotation. And well, carefully extracting this error, we can basically c control the error at each, uh, uh, at the next time step and get an ODE type of argument which will allow us to claim that the error will vanish at this rate. So far, so good? Okay. 
Now, that was the no isotropic case. Now, of course, the more interesting scenario is to look where the entries of the input are actually correlated. Well, in this case, we can hermit expand and do algebraic manipulations to obtain similar looking the trace objective. Uh, unfortunately, here we cannot prove that rigorously that weight ion is optimal. So we just look at the experiments and experimentally weight ion is again optimal. So we will just fix the matrix A to be tied to matrix B in this fashion again. Now, uh, this structure here of the diagonal matrix of, 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 of the spectra of the covariance uh, is very convenient for the analysis. So basically, we will assume that the eigenvalues of D, uh, eigenvalues of sigma, will be in blocks, and each block will have size Ki, and uh, the eigenvalues are ordered. Again, without loss of generality, just for convenience. Well, now, uh, the thing is, this morally means that in blocks, the coordinates of the signal are somewhat different, and we should account for them in a different way in our encoding matrix B. Well, how we do that, we will just look at the corresponding form of matrix B, which has uh, a certain weights on each block of the coordinates. And they sum up to 1 because my B, um, or the rows of my B lies in sphere. Okay, now, given this, we can rewrite the previous trace objective more nicely. This will be uh, this form here. Uh, what is important is that M is essentially BB transpose, which can be composed of the block decomposition of B. And now we will try to basically deal with this term. Now, the idea is the following. We again will treat the term, which is linear, uh, somewhat separately, and look at the rest of the powers uh, uh, right now. So what we do is that, well, we subtract the diagonal and we look at the off diagonal. Now, the thing is, function g is odd, so if you multiply it by x, it will be even, which is very nice. Then we can just say, well, let's just ignore this term. It's just not there, because it's non-negative. Now, this allowed us to control everything in f, except the linear piece. And now for linear piece, idea is the following. Well, the cross terms in the sum, we can just make them vanish because it's the trace of two PSD matrices, so it's not negative. We can just say, well, it's zero. And for the term, which is power two, uh, we will basically use the same estimate as previously for the Hadamard power two. Well, how we do that? Well, the trace can be essentially rewritten in terms of the scalar product with uh, uh, a unit vector and the Hadamard power of the matrix, and then we just use the bound and lower bounded like this. All right, so now, okay, to give a bit of intuition why it's sane to assume that this vanishes and this vanishes, because uh, in, the, in the construction of the asymptotically optimal uh, candidates to attain the lower bound, we will essentially use rotations, and for rotation, well, the off diagonal will be small, and almost all the blocks will be orthogonal, approximately. That's why this bound will be tight. Now, in these terms, we can rewrite this objective even more nicely in this form. It starts to look like something nice and convex, which we can solve. Well, idea is now is that uh, here uh, in the lower bound, SI is the rank of the corresponding block B, BI, BI transpose. And we can essentially show by a convex uh, type of argument that the, these ranks will be water filled. What do I mean by that is the following. So assume that your dimension is, let me compute, 90. Uh, it's the input dimension. And then you have uh, the compressed dimension, which is of size uh, 20. Then basically, all the ranks in this case will go into the first block. We won't use uh, any other block in any way. You will basically try to utilize the eigenspace of the highest eigenvalues. Now, as, D, as n increases, so in this case, it will be, let me compute, 50, uh, you will start to fill the second block, 
and, and so on. This is important, so is this clear? Yes? Oh, okay, okay, great. So uh, let me write. So say your D is 90, yes? And your B had that nice form. Yes, this block form. Uh, so basically, and you have uh, ranks for each of the blocks of B. Now essentially what I'm saying is that as N increases, so basically your rate increases, you will start to use uh, more and more of eigenvalues of your D in uh, decreasing fashion. So first you use the biggest subspace, then the next one and so on. And well, okay, for n equal to say, I don't remember what it was on this slide. It was 20. For n equal to 20, you will ba basically put all the ranks in the first block, which corresponds to the biggest eigenvalue, and don't use the, the ones which are smaller at all. Now for the second picture, here n is 50. You will basically fill in the first block as much as you can. And then you start to put in weight on the second one, and so on. Okay, hopefully now it's more clear. <laughs> All right, uh, now this will allow us to rewrite this objective, the, the, the previous objective, in even more convenient form, which now looks like a certain mass distribution problem. So basically we have M buckets, uh, K buckets, in which we want to put a mass. And um, these buckets are somewhat ordered by optimality because put, putting the mass in a certain bucket is better than in the others uh, up to some point. So at, at time zero, all the buckets are kind of ordered, but then if you filled in one bucket, at some point you might want to fill the second bucket because derivative in the second bucket is basically bigger and more optimal. Uh, and now, and we have this extra penalty term which just says that, well, putting too much mass with no optimization is kind of bad. Well, now this is somewhat a very much convex objective which we can uh, solve using KKT conditions. And the idea here is that, well, these buckets are ordered and we just need to find an active set. What do I mean by active set? Is a set of weights which are non-zero. Uh, and how we can do that is basically looking at KKT condition and doing binary search. Well, now a bit of synthetic data. So if you look at the Gaussian with uh, blocks of size uh, 20, 20, 35, and 25, and the corresponding eigenvalues which are listed here, and another configuration here, we can see that the, if we just uh, minimize the population risk directly or use uh, SGD for outer encoder, but by sampling from non isotropic Gaussian, the bound is very much tight. And uh, what is in red here, this basically corresponds to the derivatives of the lower bound. So what happens here is that first block is kind of getting filled, then you, then you have discontinuity, and you jump and start to fill in the second block, here you fill in the third block, and so on. So you can see this water filling quite nicely in the derivatives. One thing which is important to say is that it's not necessarily switches every time at the length of the block. So basically what might happen is the following. You used all the ranks for the first block and already put it a few ranks here, but you will still never use it. You will basically put the weight to it to zero. Sometimes it can happen. It just follows from KKT conditions whether it's optimal to still put all the mass here or, or use a bit of mass here. Now, this is synthetic data. You might ask, well, I'm not interested in synthetic data. What happens in, uh, at least at CIFAR? Well, we can see that uh, what, we can do, what we can do here is that we take the images, we compute their empirical covariance, we SVD it and we use that spectrum for the lower to infer the lower bound. And as we can see that the SGD sits quite nicely on the lower bound, although the data is not entirely Gaussian. Now the question is here is that both for isotropic case and non-isotropic case, 
Gaussian prediction seems to be very good, actually. So is there some universality going on? Well, now I will try to answer this question. So at this point, I will fix myself to only IID data. So my input will have no correlations. It will be just different distribution of the components. And I will look at the first prototypical example of data, which is better than Gaussian. It's Gaussian with a sparse component. Uh, why it's better than Gaussian? Well, information theoretically, rate distortion for it is much better. So leaning to, towards the axis means that it's much more compressible, which kind of makes sense because if you have a delta spike at zero, you have much more information about uh, your source and how to compress it. Now, unfortunately, for sparse Gaussian, you cannot compute rate distortion in closed form, so you need to rely on numerics, but dimension is one here, so it, it works nicely. Don't use Blah with the remote at dimension 100. It's not going to work. Um, well, now the question is, OK, let's take this input data model and use auto, our autoencoder to train on it. And the question is, that will the autoencoder see any structure in this source? Answer is, unfortunately, but fortunately for us, that's why it's interesting, uh, uh, it doesn't see any sparsity. So basically, if you train an autoencoder, you will obtain just a Gaussian performance. You have no improvement. Well, I will very quickly sketch how you go about the proof. Uh, the idea is the following. So sparse Gaussian is essentially Gaussian which is masked with correct scalings. Then somewhat, if dimension is large, we can formulate the equivalent objective to the population risk. It looks almost familiar to the previous one, except this horrible matrix here and this rescaling here. So what matrix here does, essentially you take the matrix B, you take the corresponding mask for Gaussian, you mask all the rows with respect to this mask, and then you rescale the rows to be norm one. This is what hat means, and M means masking. Now the idea here is that very painfully, with a lot of concentration and approximation, uh, we can basically show that for certain functions, which will appear in the gradient dynamics, essentially this rescaling and masking can be just traded off with initial B, which will say that essentially the gradient, uh, the gradient trajectory for the sparse Gaussian and Gaussian will be very close. And then this result can be bootstrapped to the whole gradient trajectory by a Gronwell type bound. Well, okay, that was sparse Gaussian. Now, question is, okay. Uh, no, so yeah, renormalizing. Uh, okay, so uh, one important thing is that normalizing the row is not cheating because you have sign, yeah, so you don't right. really care. But yeah, that, that normalizing certainly helps to have the same order. Yes, because essentially if you normalize, your order will be square root of P because you're masking with it, and it will cancel out things nicely. But then in order to do that, the issue is that you will need to get an argument which works along the whole trajectory, so you will really need to be careful about the constants, how you extract them in the error, because you don't want your error to blow up in finite time. Well, that was sparse Gaussian. Now, the question is that can we say anything about arbitrary IID source? Well, not rigorously, but we can conjecture the following. So we will basically choose between two candidates, one of them is rotationally invariant design. So basically, I will pick my matrix B and A to be tight. And U here is a, a matrix which is uniformly sampled from special orthogonal group. Or the second candidate is basically let me do nothing and just pass a subset of coordinates depending on rate. This is literally let me just pass a subset of X. Now. Fortunately enough, uh, this, uh, the, uh, the performance of the rotation invariant design can be computed via AMP. And this can be just computed brute force. And then we can get the following selection criteria, which might look a bit of bogus. But essentially what you're doing, you look at your distribution, 
you look at the its absolute, first absolute moment, and then you try to evaluate it with respect to the corresponding one over Gaussian. If it's bigger, then you can do better than Gaussian by just doing nothing and selecting a subset of coordinates. If your distribution in this sense is worse than Gaussian, that what you are basically doing here, you rotate your distribution, you make it approximately Gaussian, and then you go with it. Now, okay, let me get some justification for what I just said. So uh, here we look at sparse Rademacher data. So it's basically a delta spike at zero and uh, suitably rescaled Rademacher to get variance one. And what happens is that precisely at the conjecture transition point, uh, you switch from rotationally invariant design, which gives you essentially Gaussian performance in this case, to a permutation of identity design. And here on the left, you can see heat map of B uh, of one of the points on the, on the flat region here. And it looks like very much uniform rotation. And on the slope here, it looks like permutation of identity. Well, uh, you can see that there are two values here. One of them is like light green, one of them is light blue. I'm not sure you can see it. Uh, it's because we don't really care about sign because sign can always be canceled by the decoding matrix. Well, what is nice here actually that a certain very interesting behavior appears when the uh, permutation of identity candidate is optimal. Basically, if you look at loss of your SGD, uh, it will look as follows. Very quickly, your SGD will go to the Gaussian performance and it will kind of recover arbitrary rotation. Then it will spend there quite a bit of time in search for the sparse direction and then it will quickly go to the permutation of identity solution. So basically you have these two phases. You first go to the suboptimal Gaussian performance in the case of sparse and Demacher data and then you transition to the optimal performance which is given by deterministic permutation of identity. Now, this is, this is not just uh, one experiment on sparse Demacher data. This is pretty, pretty much consistent for any source we tried on. And uh, this behavior is kind of uniform on all of them. We didn't try all the distributions, obviously, but here's the, uh, the, the list of which we tried. Now the question is that, okay, uh, that's good. My uh, decoder is a bit stupid. Uh, now can I do anything about it? Uh, well, the first obvious choice is to introduce another function on top to enrich the decoding performance. So basically to denoise whatever estimate was, was, was given here. Now uh, the hunch is that in this case, a similar transition happens. You will again choose between the rotation and the permutation of identity. There's nothing new will pop up. So here on the left, uh, you can see that um, this part of the curve, of the blue curve here, it corresponds to rotation invariant design. So basically from AMP, we can get the state evolution parameters and then compute the optimal denoising function, which will be a conditional expectation. And this is like solid blue line up to this point. And at this point, we just use permutation of identity uh, for which denoising is just rescaling. So you do nothing. And then, yes, once the permutation of identity starts becoming optimal, you just select it. Yes? The question, this is the same function that you used earlier for the conversion? Oh, no, 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 no. So, so sorry, uh, bad, bad, bad notation, bad notation. This one is specifically picked up for the, okay. <coughs> If you train it, we parameterize it depending on the source. So for sparse Gaussian, and it will be something like this. Do you, do you see it? Okay, the intuition why we pick up this one because in the noise paper uh, by Kui and others, uh, they use basically something like this for a denoising architecture. And if you just say that A, B are the identities and C is just some rescaling, and okay, after rescaling, you will map to this denoiser. But this denoiser works very well for like sparse Gaussian and some other mixtures we considered. Uh, the issue for sparse Rademacher, you won't pick it because 
if you look at optimal denoiser for sparse Adama here, it looks kind of like this. Well, you can see it will be very poorly approximated by something which has a linear behavior at infinity. So for that one, we, we pick the, non, the parametric nonlinearity there to be like a mixture of tan H's, basically. So, uh, okay, well, one thing I should mention is that when you train, you pick a parametric nonlinearity, and when you evaluate these bounds, you pick the optimal one, because you can compute. Uh, that did the sound of question? Okay, good. Um, so again, uh, this is heat map on the, on the rotationally invariant uh, part of the curve. It looks pretty uniform. And again, on the identity slope, it looks precisely like something sparse and uh, being equal to the permutation of identity. Now, this is here just to show that sometimes identity is just always optimal independently how you tweak the parameters of the distribution. This is an experiment for a mixture of Gaussians where we vary the aspect ratio. So basically, for that one, it is always optimal to just pick your signal and do nothing with it and just rescale during the noising. Well, uh, maybe unsatisfactory, but it is what it is. Uh, and a bit of a <clears throat> side note, you can actually go deeper. Uh, although, okay, here uh, we look at the Rigamp algorithm uh, and we try to map it to the sane enough for machine learning people decoding architecture. Uh, so basically, it's schematically describes here. Uh, you have two flows here. One estimates your uh, signal X, and the other refines your uh, observable Z, which is like uh, basically sigma of BX. And here, you have a bunch of matrices. You have uh, a parametric merging function, which basically does this. So you have two vectors, A and B, and you will just sum up them with some coefficients alpha and beta, and these coefficients are trained. And uh, a functions f, uh, f1, f2, and g, uh, they again a parametric functions of this form, and everything is trained, all the weights are trained. And the weight matrices here, which are w1, w2, and w, and v1, are trained too. So if you do that, uh, this will basically correspond to two steps of Rigamp algorithm uh, with some denoiser, which is learned. You will see that, well, you approach quite closely already the bias optimal prediction, which will be given you by the vector IMP algorithm. So at this point, we didn't go deeper because it was satisfactory enough. So basically, the idea is that if you enrich your decoding, at least in an intelligent way, and you just train it, then you can reach bias optimal performance. But here, the rotationally invariant design of the encoding is fixed. Well, that's it for me. Thank you, my collaborators. And yeah, uh, any questions? Any questions? I can start. Uh, thank you very much. Really nice uh, series of works. Um, you mentioned very briefly that Hugo, for the first part, no, when you were looking at the two-layer case, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. who got this nice idea of putting a skip connection and then beating the non-Gaussianity um, uh -huh. with that, right? Uh -huh. So your dynamical analysis, for example, can you can you still do that in this case? What would change? Uh, uh, well, the issue is that I didn't really look at it. The question is that whether you can rewrite your trace, uh, your population risk mm -hmm. as, as a suitable trace objective, which will have form of that kind, maybe with additional term. But the ultimate issue is the following. I will write it here. So here we relied quite heavily that function f, which appears in the population risk computation, it's odd because sign will give you like uh, odd hermit expansion, then you will take the covariates of it to, to, to the power two, and you will get an odd function here. So basically, to answer your question, 
if you pick up something different, say ReLU, it will result in something like x plus x2 plus x4 plus x6 with coefficients, but you will get these powers. And the issue is that for this, um, you will get a different minimizer. It's not a rotation. It's a equiangular tight frame. And uh, the problem is that in this case, we can treat something like this. So when you have like dyadic powers, and mm, so you will have x and dyadic powers, and how you do that, you basically take that bound from Hare, which controls the Hadamard power two, you bootstrap it on itself, and it's magically tight, exactly at the, at the powers two. But when you put in the bunch any power which has kind of like something else than power two, it doesn't work. I mean, we have a conjecture, but we cannot prove it. Yeah, I mean, it essentially it should look like your matrix will be kind of ETF-ish. So you'll have unit diagonal, and of diagonal you'll have something like minus C. And this C will depend on the trade-off between the coefficients here. We have time maybe for one last question, but otherwise there's been already quite a few during the talk. Just out of curiosity, uh, why did you treat this uh, case where the covariance has this block structure? Ah, uh, I mean, uh, okay, this is somewhat without loss of generality. Also, uh, asymptotic optimality is using this. So, let me just quickly go there. So you can always assume that your blocks just have size one. Okay. So it's no problem. But the issue is that when you prove the optimality that we saturate the lower bound, you will need that the ratio between the block size and the kind of the total length is non-vanishing in the limit. So you kind of assume that you have like block structure, even though the blocks can be arbitrarily small, just they are not required to be zero at the limit when you take the limit. Um, yeah, so uh, another result that I liked was the sort of learning of distributions of increasing complexity that you showed, you know, that you sort of learn the Gaussian approximation first and then you ah, yeah, yeah. exploit sort of the additional... Oh, I forgot to mention, you can probably prove with the techniques we have the first phase. Okay, that's nice. Uh, the phase which is here. The phase which is here, okay? How yeah. you go about it somewhat, uh, at this phase you're very close to rotation. Yeah. So basically you can, even though your signal is not really a Gaussian, you can still kind of hermit expand up to some error. And with enough of control of this error, probably you will be able to show that before certain time scale, you won't escape, escape the Gaussian performance. Okay, but now, now I'm going to be annoying and I'm going to ask about the things that you can't prove. Okay, so if you, if you then go to the... If to you're the, here, yes. Exactly, so do you have an intuition of like, um, obviously then things get harder to analyze, but okay, do you have an intuition of the objective that the network is then looking at? Is it just looking for the next term in, in a Hermite expansion? Is it looking at uh, everything else at the same time? Like, do you have a... Okay, one thing which I can tell, <laughs> you can ask Kevin, I guess he wants to answer. Can we can also take this offline after the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it would be taking like higher order things first, but then when it starts taking the next order, it's a bit unclear theoretically, although there is some, some intuition that it would just kind of do it in a way. Like it would slowly converge to identity, and then there would be this, this mixture phase. Like it would first start taking the next order, like this one we could probably analyze. After that, it's not exactly clear. So this would probably be some longer discussion, but yeah. And the same thing for ETF. So basically, at some point, you will start to prioritize a certain rank one direction, which is like aligned with a vector full of ones. And if you look at how the training looks like, you don't really know which of the eigen, eigen vectors of your SVD it and it will go to that vector somewhat. At certain point, like this chaos happens, and then one of them sufficiently aligns, then a new dominant term pops up in your expansion for the gradient, and you kind of go along with it. But when it happens, when the switch happens, I'm pretty sure it's pretty random. And I'm not, I don't have a good idea how to control that one. Okay, let's, let's thank Alexander again.